Hello friends, welcome back to Heartscapes, where we're learning the system of Reiki to be rooted, to be spacious, to be connected, and to remember ourselves. My name is Michaela. Welcome back to the studio. So glad to have you here. One of the things that I sometimes talk about on this channel and that I teach to in my classes for other Reiki practitioners is how to cultivate a trauma-informed perspective within our Reiki practices. In essence, this invites us to acknowledge and understand that many of us are carrying uh, the residue of traumatic events in our bodies and our minds, and that there are things that can uh, we can encounter in our environment and in our relationships that can trigger the fear, the um, anger, the difficulties, the pain of those traumatic events if we have not um, you know, gone through a process of moving them out of our bodies. And it invites us as Reiki practitioners to make shifts in our mindsets, in our protocols, in the practices that we engage in that create a container of safety, of trust, that offers many opportunities for choice and for clients to give consent around what they're experiencing so that they can have some level of control over their experience. This is a body of work that's grown out of my personal experience, my research, my work with other organizations and in other realms, and it's a piece of work that I am really dedicated to and feel really proud of. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, when I began sharing this work out into the world within our Reiki communities, I have experienced a certain degree of pushback, um, of challenges from folks on different aspects of this teaching. Uh, for example, I shared a video um, a little while back with my response to criticism about my questioning the statement, Reiki can do no harm. I'll put that link down below, but as a spoiler, it involves making the distinction between Reiki as a phenomenon in the world, as an energy, as a presence in the world, and the system of Reiki, a system of practice enacted by people on other people. I'll let you guess which one of those has the potential to cause harm. So occasionally I get to have really interesting conversations with folks um, really navigating some of these questions, some of these points of contention, these challenges. Uh, and it always gives me really important food for thought um, to help you know, strengthen and clarify my perspectives on these things and to create better offerings for all of you around these topics. And recently, another of these questions came up um, in a conversation that I actually was really um, intrigued by. It really caused me to pause and spend some time thinking about it. It's actually something that had kind of been in the back of my mind and I hadn't really you know, worked through as of yet. And so I really appreciated the opportunity to do that. In essence, the um, statement that was posed from another Reiki practitioner was, it's not my responsibility to take care of everybody's potential trauma triggers. I can't possibly account for everything that anybody's gonna walk in the door with, and it's not my responsibility to create a safe space for everybody in all circumstances. It's not possible, and it's, it's not um, giving people the opportunity to do their own healing work, which they are responsible for. Now, part of me wanted to immediately object to this, <laughs> to say, no, we are responsible for creating a safe space for the folks that come into our door. And there was a piece that actually felt really important, again, to work with for me, because I also really believe in the statement that while the harms that were caused to us in our past were not necessarily our fault, typically they were not our fault, but the aftermath of that as adults is our responsibility. That we do have a responsibility to recognize when we have been harmed and in particular to recognize when that harm is causing us to behave in ways with the people in our lives that are problematic, that might be causing further harm to ourselves or to others. And so both of those things are true. Um, and I wanted to, you know, again, refine this conversation a little bit with that in mind. And as I was sitting with it this week, uh, there was a, an analogy that came up that felt like the perfect way to help us understand 
the point of balance, the, the point of um, navigating these two things that come to a more of a non-dualistic place rather than these two seeming extremes. Those extremes being, on the one hand, everybody is responsible for their own stuff. I, as a Reiki practitioner, shouldn't be responsible for making anything more safe for one person versus another person. That's your responsibility to deal with your trauma. On the other hand, I, as a Reiki practitioner, need to contort my practice and to practically bubble wrap my studio so that it's the softest, safest possible place for absolutely everybody who comes in. Hopefully you can see that these are two fairly unrealistic extremes. So where's the middle ground? So I want to first um, just share, you know, why it matters that we find this middle place and why the original statement, it's not my responsibility to make a safe space for everyone who comes in, doesn't exactly land for me as fully true, or at least it doesn't align with my values and the way that I want to run my practice and the way that I encourage other people to run their practice for two main reasons. First and foremost, a Reiki session is not, is a particular type of space. And it's different than other forms of business transactions that we might be engaged with, with people. It's inherently an intimate practice, an intimate space that asks and, you know, in many ways requires for effectiveness, our clients to put themselves in a rather vulnerable position, physically vulnerable as they're often lying down with eyes closed, emotionally vulnerable as they're really opening themselves to another person. They don't know what kinds of emotions might come through. There's a lot of tenderness often that is present and mental vulnerability, particularly when they're trying something new, when they're less familiar with the practice. So it's an inherently intimate and vulnerable space. And I would argue that if we are choosing as part of our path, our purpose, our profession, to intentionally create and invite people into spaces that are vulnerable and intimate, that we do have a heightened responsibility to create spaces that are safe, that are trustworthy, that give opportunities for choice and consent to the people who come through. But to what degree, right? Where is that line? Where does it tip the line into being excessively cautious such that we're actually limiting what is possible in the space, both for what we can offer and for what the client can experience? So that's kind of the question that I've been wrestling with. And the analogy that's been really helpful for me in this came to me as I was taking a walk in the newly remodeled park and playground by my house. We have this tiny little pocket park. And, you know, for the first decade that we lived here, you know, it was pretty run down, had some pretty old structures. And recently it got a completely new facelift, complete with uh, drought resistant plants and a new playground and a little stage area. It's just fabulous. We love it. And so my daughter and I have been spending a lot of time over there. And I noticed something, something stood out to me immediately about the way that they redesigned the playground. And in order to, you know, really get to why this was so surprising, we need to take a little bit of a trip back in time. So I am almost 46 years old. And for those of you who are around my age or a little older, you might remember the absolute death trap of a wasteland that playgrounds used to be. Most of the playgrounds that I grew up with as a small child were, I can only say, actively dangerous, right? It's almost as if the design of these playgrounds was actively, intentionally designed to increase the potential for children to get hurt. And certainly to make it very easy for children to hurt each other with our childish pranks the ground of these playgrounds was often a hard asphalt that would get blisteringly hot in the summer. The, constru the, the structures would often be made of splintery wood that would splinter off into our hands or um, you know, iron or, or metal, probably it wasn't iron, but anyway, metal bars and beams that you know, just the, the slightest hit uh, on our head would cause bruising and pain. And then there was those merry-go-rounds. Do you remember those metal merry-go-rounds? 
the one that's in the thumbnail. Rusty, creaky metal platforms with these metal bars that you would hold on to for dear life as somebody just cranked them as fast as they could go. The game was to see if you could stay on, right? If you could actually hold on to the thing and not get just flung into oblivion, probably smacking your head on those aforementioned metal bars on your way off of the thing. It was definitely a game that involved the intentional uh, attempt to hurt each other, right? <laughs> to get each other to fly off of those things and, and get hurt, typically. So in other words, the playgrounds that I grew up with um, were not soft, sweet places. And we often got hurt. On the other hand, it was a lot of fun to take those risks, to be actively engaged in activities that were a little bit dangerous or a lot dangerous, depending on this on the structure. And we benefited from that, while at the same time, often got hurt. I know kids who broke bones, others who got, you know, fairly bad head injuries. And I know, um, you know, there were people who really got seriously injured in playgrounds like that. And so, as we entered into the 90s, there was this wave of reform when it came to children's playgrounds. And as those old playgrounds from the 70s and 80s were beginning to be rebuilt, they implemented the like no harm form of play structures. Perhaps you remember these. These were the play structures my oldest daughter played on. She's now 25 when she was a little kid. That asphalt ground was replaced with spongy, springy um, rubber grounds, or perhaps these like kind of weird, like rubber confetti, um, you know, I don't even know what you would call it. Very soft, spongy grounds. Uh, the play structures that used to be either hard metal or splintery wood were replaced with this like padded metal, right? So all of the corners and everything were padded. No longer could you climb, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet in the air on these plane structures. You maybe were lucky if you could get six feet off the air. Oftentimes, it would just be kind of a series of platforms with a few steps in between that the kids would run around and, you know, little things that they could climb on that were maybe a foot or two off the ground. And the slides, friends, the slides. Gone were these slick metal steep slides that you could get a legitimate speed going, right? Just sailing down those things from my youth. No, these new slides were made of textured plastic with sides that curved up around you, creating this like little cozy tunnel. But you couldn't get up any speed on those things. You had to often just scoot your way down to even get to the bottom of the slide. My daughter gave up on them pretty quickly. That's just no fun in it. They were much more fun to climb up than to slide down. Gone were those uh, merry-go-rounds, just nothing like that in sight anymore. And overall, the amount of injuries that kids experienced in those play structures went down significantly. But over time, there was something else that went down as a result of this wide sweeping reform of our playgrounds. And that was the ability and the opportunity for our kids to take risks to push the boundaries of what they could do a little bit, to learn to employ caution at, as a balancing point to risk, to find their place of what they could and could not do, and learn to push that a little bit more, a little bit more. These are the types of activities that play is really designed for, right? That as a species, you know, the play that we do as children is designed to help us learn to grow into adults who can be fully capable of taking on the challenges that adulthood requires. We need to be able to take risks. We need to be able to get uncomfortable, to push our boundaries of what we can and can't do, to make mistakes and fail and maybe get hurt a little bit so that we can learn where those boundaries are and we can adjust with more caution next time. We can push past our fear, we can cultivate courage, and we can cultivate tenacity. And these were the kinds of qualities that it started to be noticed and it started to be studied that were decreasing in children of the generations that grew up in these play structures. 
It was a really interesting set of studies that started coming out in the early 2000s that you know were really documenting the impact of, in essence, wrapping the kids in bubble wrap, right? Wrapping the playground in bubble wrap, cultivating an idea that we should make a, a playground a place where nobody could possibly be harmed. It's not realistic and it's not actually beneficial. So here we are in the 2020s. And once again, we're seeing reforms of playgrounds. In our new play structure here in our new park, there's this very interesting geometric structure that fills the center of the playground. It's essentially a large three-dimensional net, like a giant spider's web that the kids can climb. And it goes pretty high. You can get, I don't know, 20, 25 feet up in the air, uh, climbing on these ropes. The metal structure of it is softer, a little bit more padded than the iron bars of old. And the ground is spongy and soft. It's not that asphalt that if you fell and hit it, you would seriously hurt yourself. Um, but it absolutely gives children the opportunity to stretch the, the capabilities, take risks, do something a little dangerous, make mistakes. We just had a community potluck over there and I heard a kid start to cry in the background. I looked over and she had fallen off of one of the small, the lower rungs. Her dad was right there monitoring her, her climbing because she was a pretty, pretty little kid and she'd only fallen a foot or so, but you know, it was enough to jar her, to, to startle her and to cause her to cry a little bit. And I just had this moment of, of just in my mind, like flashing through that evolution of the playground and feeling really appreciative of where we've landed. A design that does take into account the requirement of we as adults who design playgrounds, who design Reiki sessions, to create certain baseline standard protocols of safety for the people who will utilize our spaces. And the value and the importance of allowing for a certain sense of risk taking, of pushing boundaries and challenging ourselves. And so, you know, in that moment, while I was watching the little kid get uh, comforted by her dad, I really, I realized what a valuable metaphor this is for this question of what degree, if any, we implement trauma-informed practices within our Reiki circles, our spaces, our sessions, our classes. Because in essence, we have a similar kind of situation. We have a space that we're inviting people into where they're going to experience something that might challenge them, that might feel risky, that might invite them or give them the opportunity or even um, you know, the, the unwanted opportunity to grow and to be uncomfortable and to change in some way. It's a space that can cause harm if it's not carefully designed with certain things in mind. There are certain baseline safety protocols that I strongly argue is our responsibility to put into place as people who hold vulnerable, intimate spaces. For example, always getting consent from our client before using physical touch with them. Physical touch can be a powerful trigger if we've experienced um, harm to our body. And this should always be something that a person is given the opportunity to consent to, even if it's typical for there to be light touch involved with a Reiki session. That to me is a baseline safety protocol that's essential to put into place. And there are a collection of others. I've identified 10, 10 areas of interest, places we can take a look at and assess whether or not we want to make adjustments in those areas. Again, it's about mindsets, about practices that we implement, that we make standard across our whole practice so that everybody who walks through the door is offered the same baseline level of safety, trust, opportunities to make choices and to give their consent for what they are going to experience so that they have some level of control over what it is they experience. And that to me is what it means to cultivate a trauma-informed Reiki practice. It means finding that middle ground, that non-dualistic space where we have taken account of safety and trust. And at the same time, we haven't eliminated every possible 
moment of risk taking and discomfort. Discomfort is necessary for growth, for change, for transformation. But carelessness on the part of the people that we've entrusted to take care of us is not, right? It's up to each of us as practitioners to find the line on the spectrum that feels right for us. It's up to us as clients who would go to services like this to pay attention to how our practitioners are defining that line and how they're taking care of it. And this is why I offer the work that I do, to help us have that conversation, to give some framework for how we might think through it, to give us a wide range of options in how we might make modifications in our practice to create those containers of safety, trust, choice, and consent. And if you'd like to learn more about our classes for Reiki practitioners on cultivating a trauma-informed Reiki practice, check the description below for links. So that's what I have for you today. It's just been on my mind, this playground analogy. I found it really, really useful for clarifying my position on this topic. I hope that it'll be useful for you as well. I really welcome your questions, your comments, your pushbacks. If you disagree with me, totally uh, happy to talk about it. Uh, I love a good respectful dialogue about points of disagreement. Drop those down in the comment section or go ahead and reach out to me by email. I'll put the website information down below. And as you navigate these questions, as you navigate the playgrounds in your life, the intimate and vulnerable spaces that you may encounter, may you be deeply provisioned for those spaces. Until next time, thanks for joining me. I love you. Goodbye.